Leanne, thanks for coming. How are you? I'm doing good. How are you doing? I'm very well. I'm very well. It's actually nice and sunny today. We should make a change for what it's been like. Yeah, torrential has been horrendous, isn't it? I know. Every time I look at the 10-day forecast, we wouldn't have enough to talk about in the UK, would we, if we didn't talk <laughs> about the weather? But a lot of the 10-day forecast, everyone looked, look, it was like rain. Great. Are we can have any sun at some point. Well, my mother's in the west of Ireland, and any time I ring her, and I intentionally ring her when I'm in, she's not listening, I hope, ever, I ring her when, I, when I'm in the car. Because I can then justify, I'm just popping into the shop, or I'm here. But it's like, beep, hello, hello, ma'am. Oh, how are you doing? What's the weather like over there? It's the first question every <laughs> single time. 20 years in the UK today. Is it? Yeah. Blink your neck. Or in Wales. Does that, you know, I'm not <clears throat> as long in Wales as in Ireland. But do you get to a certain stage where you actually technically become it's an hour. Welsh? Where in Ireland are you from? Very west coast, a place called Mayo. Okay, all my family are from Cape Clear, which is west. It's a tiny little island, three miles by three miles. Off the off which county? Galway? Cork. Cork. Oh, further yeah. kind of southwest. Really south, yeah. Okay. Yeah, tiny little village. My grandfather came over when he was really young to the docks of Cardiff. Okay. Uh, married a Welsh girl. And uh, you had 13 brothers. Yeah, that, that's kind of wow. the norm back then. Yeah. yeah. We come Te- from potato stock, that's what I say. Yeah. T- tell, tellies, were, tellies were invented and then families reduced. No, they were Catholics as well. So we were all Catholics until, well, I was until I was about 12, I think, <laughs> when I rebelled. <laughs> Do you go back often? At all? Never. Never? No. I've been to Dublin a couple of times. Oh, that's not Cork, Ireland. But not really. You always no. say that. No. It's you always I'm, say Dublin's on Ireland. Like I'm due a trip. I'm it's like going trip. to London and thinking... That's the whole of the mm. UK, and it's it's Scotland and Wales and all that. Well, like Americans do think that is the, the whole of the UK. In fairness, they do. They might know Manchester at a push, but uh, Wales is always part of England, isn't it? I when everyone speaks to a lot Irish tourism to, to pay. But flight from Bristol into a little village, little it's not a village; it's an airport on a mountain called Knock. I'm talking about Catholicism and all this. Seemingly, it's where Mary appeared 150 years ago. There's a big shrine, and there's all these little shops that sell tack but other than that and the airport that's it but you get into you get to there and there's a lovely city called Galway which is half an hour away mm. and it's superb it's got loads of shows and it's got um, a huge amount of pubs and restaurants and all that it's a very touristy place but it is proper Ireland unlike yeah, yeah. Dublin did Ed she write a song about it uh, Galway he did yeah, yeah. <laughs> so obviously got some uh Memories for him, anyway. I'll, I'll I'll come back from the road we're going down. Yeah, exactly. Um, how's things? How's business? Busy by all accounts. Good, Casablanca really and everything. Yeah, so um, we diversified a little bit and um, decided to open the Casablanca on the original site that it was on. So originally an old chapel. Yeah. Um, that became a bingo hall. That became a club. Um. So we decided, well, I say we, I decided to um, turn it into what's going to be more offices uh, for the staff, for the agents and the producing side of the business. Um, and I decided to put a bar in it. So I thought... For the staff. For the staff. <laughs> <laughs> That's what happened. That's the absolute truth. And I thought, well, it'd just be for the clients to come in and have a, a glass of, and a tea and coffee at lunchtime kind of thing or whatever. Um and it just grew. And what ended up happening was people just kept saying, oh, my God, this is amazing. You're opening on the old site. I used to go there. So this huge amount of people who'd been there back in 1986 or something watching Spandau Ballet um, all decided they thought it was a great idea for me to have somewhere for people to come locally. And considering in the area, most places have closed, all the pubs have closed yeah. around us and Mischief's as there now is going yeah, yeah, as well. Yeah. It's going, is it? Going. God, it's been so, a few years, isn't it? So, you know, it, it's, it was just a bit like, okay, well, let's just see what happens. We've got a pavement license for like 25 people, I think maybe more. Um, and we opened five weeks ago and it's been really busy. So we're open from, at the moment, 12 till 10, seven days a week. Okay. It'll be 10 till 10 soon. We do things like tapas, nice. uh, cheese boards, meat boards, you know, goat, you know, peppers and goat's cheese, that kind of thing. Um, and we've been supported by other businesses like Corrado's. They've been amazing at helping us uh, 
and also Caesar's Arms have been lots of lots right. of advice, Cameo Club. So they're all friends in business who know that it's. I have no idea about that side of the world, apart from <laughs> eating in those restaurants and bars, eating, drinking in those bars. Um, and so that's why, you know, that's how it, it happened. And it's, as I said, it's, do, it's doing really well so far. You going to put music in there? No live music. No. Possibly. I, I doubt we've we've got music in there, but not not live, not live music. music. Possibly we were thinking about doing some acoustic guitarists and things like that on a nice. Sunday, maybe. Yes, bit of an open evening type of thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Nice, nice. It, I, I I kind of originally started out in the pub trade, working for Whitbread and pubs, restaurants. Oh. I do I do love that kind of thing. It's always been one of my. I never actually want to run one again because mm. I did that living on site and all that. But I quite. I do like that because I like to eat out and I like to kind of socialise yeah. and stuff like that. And I'd love to do what you've done. Mm. It's interesting because it's all new. That's all new to me. But yeah. I've made it a family business. So three of my kids are working there. Nice. Um, and I've got a manager, somebody I knew from going into a, a restaurant regularly. Um, and obviously the staff are there. And all the people we rent our other properties to go there. So we've got six production companies that rent from us. So they they're in there every week, uh, and then in the square in Mount Stewart Square, there's lots of other production companies as well. And they come in, so it's somewhere where you can just kind of be yourself, chat about work. You know, nothing's going to be shared. It's a bit of a media kind of hub feel. then. Yeah, a little bit of yeah, a media yeah. hub. We've also got the Ukrainians that come over from the hub. My friend Helen's one of the main people who run run that. Okay. Um, so lots of writers and and uh, directors of of uh, Ukrainian films. Uh, come over and use the space just to, to sit and write all afternoon as well. Um, and then the locals. So lots of the locals um, come in, which is really great because it just makes, you know, they're, they're over the moon that somebody's done it and it's somebody who's come from Cardiff as well and whose family originate from across the street. So and I'm, my my parents grew up in you know, Grangetown. So, you know, I felt it was my duty to, to do something. Uh nice. For the family, really. Well, that's nice. Yeah, it's, it's a nice thing, isn't it? It's just something different, a bit of diversification as well. Yeah, isn't it, Jamie? Like, yeah and I think because obviously, you know, I started out as a, a kid on a council estate um, and I got a scholarship to go to drama school. Um, and at 17, I left home and never returned home to my mum and dad's house. Um, but just constantly worked as a performer in the West End. I did things like Les Mis and Fame and other shows like that in the West End. Um, and then decided to open up my own agency because I was working for a friend and doing really well at getting him, his clients work. So I was agenting in the day uh, for somebody else and performing at night. So I'd be playing Fontaine at night and <laughs> agenting in the day. Um, and I did that for a good few years. Um, and then I decided, right, that time has come to open my own. So I packed in performing and just put everything into five grand, five grand on my credit card, borrowed, you know, borrowed a, a desk and a chair and computer on HP back in the day, mm. 23 years ago, and um, just grew it organically. And yeah. I think ultimately what I learned really quite early on was that you know, it's only so far you can go with organic growing unless you're really lucky. Yeah. Um, you know, it, you know, it, you can only, unless you take calculated risks in other areas of life, which is I did in property. Um, it's very different. It's difficult to grow a business un unless you've got backers or other people who know that world more than you. Because I wasn't a financial person. I wasn't an academic. I was just everything going on, everything. So I had to bring in good bookkeepers and good, good uh, accountants. Otherwise, I'd have probably spent the money. Yeah, see, I think, it, and that, that's a big lesson in business, to surround yourself with the right people, isn't Absolutely. it? Absolutely. And the right kind of team around you to kind of, to take some of the skills off you that you mm. don't have, do you know what I mean? Yeah, I think that more, more than anything else, that's what I've learned. It's like I've opened a, ca a cafe bar. Um, I, I'm, I'm a good cook anyway. I'm good with food, good, good with presentation. Um I'm, I know what it's what I expect my staff to be able to behave when people come in the door, um, but I'm not a manager. So I'm, I'm well, I manage agents and I manage actors, but I'm not a manager of people within hospitality. So I've had to bring in recruit people who've done that. That's all they know, um, and that's all they want to know. That's they feel passionate about. Uh, so that's been a huge learning curve for me, um, and I'm still on that journey for that, which is exciting because it's something yeah. that I don't 
don't know everything about, you know? Yeah, it's an interesting industry. Like I so said, I've worked in, you know, it, it isn't just about managing people, you know, it is about stock control mm. and, you know, getting your margins right and stuff. Because when you're in that kind of industry, the, the margins are quite tight on stuff. I don't know it's like now, it's probably quite yeah. kind of expensive, you know, even down to the fact of like spillage of drinks and stuff like that. Oh, yeah, like, yeah. you know, if you're running pumps and so on and so forth. But yeah, it, it bringing someone in who kind of knows how to do that side because it's that, that's a big learning curve. Do you mm. know what I mean? Like, like I'm saying, I'm passionate about food. And I like food. And I know it should be presented and the service. But and that's a big thing that's lacking these days. I'm finding a yeah. lot of places, and I think it's. I know people are struggling to get staff, but some of the experience you have in restaurants and bars at the moment is terrible. Mm. I think it, it is difficult, and also because a lot of the staff are young, so they don't really understand it. Um, that, Do they that's not care thing. as well? Is that part? No, of it? I, I don't. I don't think so. I, I think. Um, I do think the attitude to the younger generation at the moment, not with all, but some, even my own kids, you know, we have th- I have three. The one is incredibly passionate and would do absolutely anything and really works hard. The other, one of the others is a little bit more like we've got to motivate them the whole time to get them to even want to go to work. Uh, and the other one's just got an attitude like they're doing you a favor being there. So I have to do, right, this may be a family business, but I can fire you. And they have been fired at least six times in the past five weeks. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, yeah, I, I'm not very good at managing my own family. That's the only thing. And, and the reason for setting that up as well was I wanted to have a family business because mm. I've worked so hard and have these six kids that I want to to help, you know, and things like mortgages and that, they all understand. And the youngest is 10. They all they all understand about mortgages and how important saving money is and they all have their go you know go henry's and as well and their savers saving my oldest is 19 and now got his own flat he's got his own mortgage he has to pay every month um but we rent it out because he understands that the outgoings overall outgoings are like 900 pound a month it's a luxury fabulous flat but he can't really afford to live in it yet yeah and he understands that yeah so it's easiest for him to live at home rent that out till he's paid some of the mortgage off and then he knows then by the time he's 23, 24, he'll be able to have a really lovely home that's nearly paid for. And, you know, he's worked hard in his job. Um, so, you know, he can afford to do that. But it's also teaching them the value of money and that it's not going to be just handed to them. Because nobody handed me anything. You know, I had to work for it. Who, who came up with that? Did he decide he was going to do that? Did you chat to him or did you come up together? Because that is... That is superb listening to it in mm. terms of understanding the concept of money, the value of money mm. and planning for the future, um, which I think not many 19 year olds no. will do. I don't even think that many 29 year olds will actually do. But that mm. listening to that is is superb. Uh, well, I took out uh, back in the day, they were child trust funds. You know, the government 500 yeah. quid when they were born. Yeah, that's right. So for all of them, I did that. And paid just money in every week, sometimes like 25 quid, you know, back when those things were tight. Um, and it, that's obviously gained quite a bit of interest, but not massive, 10 grand, I think it is, or whatever yeah. each. But it's enough to say, right, don't go buying a car with it because you don't make any money on a car. As soon as you spent the money, you've lost money, uh, put it into property. And one thing I always swear by is property because, you know, people will always need homes. You know, same as land, they don't make any land. The land's, that's land, that's it. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, I've been able to do things in business because I have property. You know, during COVID, I if I didn't have property, we wouldn't have survived because those rental properties kept everything else going when every show and every television went stopped. You know, and we still had lots of stuff to pay. Um, and so they've learned that watching me and me discussing that with them as well. Um, and my 12 year old's already talking about putting money into stocks and shares and things. And the oldest one's done a lot with Bitcoin and he's, you know, he's, he understands that world far better than I do. Yeah. But yeah, so he saved his money and I said, well, I'll match it. And, um, but you're gonna have to get the mortgage. So he had to work, he had to work hard, get his, go to the bank and say, look, I had an interview with the bank. Um, and they were like, right, okay, you, yeah, I've saved this money. And they were like, well, you're 18. Well, it's unheard of to give an 18-year-old a mortgage. And he said, well, I've saved the money. I've been working regularly. He showed them and they said, no. 
and that was NatWest. And so I said, okay, there's lots of other banks. So we went to see lots of other banks. And then the next bank we went to see, they said, yeah, absolutely no problem at all. Nice. But, you know, it is, if a, if an 18 year old can save money and can show their, their commitment and to show their understanding of having a mortgage, that should be enough. You know, I had my own mortgage in London at 20, my yeah. first flat, because, and I was told by everybody not to do that. People say, oh, why do you want to gamble? So, well, because I'm paying 800 quid for a fl rental flat and the mortgage was like 179 pounds or something ridiculous. And, why and wouldn't I? Yeah, why, yeah. Wouldn't, why wouldn't you? So it's just common sense. I think a lot of money is actually just common sense. And for some reason we get so bogged down with graphs and charts and I even in my accountants now every every three months every quarter we get we get all the graphs and charts and stuff to the business and I look at it and go well did we make money or did we lose money well we made money great I don't want to see a graph give that to the bookkeeper you know I know I should be looking at graphs but no graph has helped me bring in money over the past 23 years you know it might look pretty and make me understand it a bit better but knowing what's in the bank account and knowing what we're lacking and yeah. and knowing which person within the company isn't performing very well uh, and addressing that is more far more important to me than seeing the graph go up and down for the last six months or three months you know yeah um yeah I money, think money is made hard I think or people complicate yes money and I think if they complicate it it makes them sound more intelligent and if they sound more intelligent they can charge more money if that's what they deal in mm. but money money as you say is very very simple you know forget about money what makes a person happy how is that going to continue for the rest of their life and yes an 18 year old is going to have a different uh plan you know for the next 40 years and when they get to 28 and 38 that will change but try and map out as long as uh, as far ahead as you can mm. and align the happiness with the money and that's very, very simple. It's not not rocket science. No, it's not. And I think it is harder for kids to get on the, you know, youngsters to get on the property ladder. So I thought, well, if I'm in a position to help him, I might not be in a position to help him this time next year or, her ne you know, next next year. Mm. None of us know what's around the corner. Oh, exactly. And all I do know is he has a property now that makes money for him every month. Um, and it's up to him if he wants to do the next one. He knows about he can do a buy a buy to let now. Yeah. But that's down to him. Yeah, yeah. And he has to save that money and he gets no help from me because I've done my bit. Yeah, you know? yeah. Um, I've got the other kids after to now to do when they get to 18. But it is about that. It is about supporting them mm. and getting them to understand there's consequences to, you know, spending that money. Um, you know, uh, buying designer jackets and designer shoes instead of doing that, put it into the bank and save money towards a, getting a mortgage. Yeah, exactly. And it, it's an educational thing, isn't it? Of course, you know and mean? we don't get taught that at school. No, we don't. None and of the kids get taught that. And, and I think, you know, as I said, my 12-year-old, he's already discussing that with me. Mm. He's already planning for his future. He says, I don't need your money, mum. He said, because I'm going to make my own. He's 12. Because I've always said that to them. But you've instilled that behaviour, oh, yeah. haven't you? And yeah. And I think that's the difference, you know. There's a lot of kids out there in the schools are not doing it. Do you know what I mean? And and that's what we're really passionate about. That like like we we got a free mortgage course, so we, we built a course which literally takes a first time buyer through every single step they need to know. Even when they go to view a property, we've got a printout sheet. These are the things you want to look for. These are some of the key things. You know, do you want it to be near a school? Do you want it to be near a pub? Do you yeah. want it to be near X, Y, and Z? So you take these things off. Yeah, this is my ideal property for this. And when you go and have a look. And it's, it's a very simple course. It's free. It takes probably about half an hour, I think, to go through the whole thing. Um, and we the give it away. The thing is they have to listen to the two of us. But mm. Unfortunately, they have to watch and listen to us. But there's a lot of free downloads on there. And it's great. And even down to what, what the, what's the bank going to look at when it comes to credit? You know, what, what are they going to want? They're going to want three months pay slips. They're going to want bank statements. We've got to make sure your bank statements don't have things like, you know, Klarna coming out of there. They don't have, like, payday loans and all these type of things. All these things they need to learn. Because mm. no one's really teaching people that. You can go on the internet and you can mm. listen to someone who's never sold a mortgage in their life to a client, never advised one, tell you how to get a mortgage yeah absolutely and they probably never even had a mortgage in their life mm. but we're trying to say look we've done this we, we this is what we do day to day with clients this is kind of it and, and we're really passionate about it. you know we got money management courses and, and i think the schools do need to educate kids about it but you know like rishi's come out with this thing hasn't he learned maths till you're 18 we don't need to learn trigonometry till you're 18 actually 99 percent of the population don't need to learn about algebra and trigonometry if i'm brutally honest mm. That's what my 12 year old says um, at the moment when he's nearly 13. He's, he absolutely hates school at the moment. He said, can I just not just work? 
I said, well, you're 12. What have you got to offer yet? You haven't got enough to offer us yet, as in, you know, in, in work work world. Um, he said, well, I can learn. He'd rather, he just wants to learn. He finds it difficult, things like algebra. Why am I sitting yeah. with learning something I am never going to use? I said, well, there's obviously some reason for it. Yes. And it's a way of thinking and a way of using your mind. I said, and it's a way of problem solving. I said, which you might not know now, but at some point in life, mm. you will wish you'd learned it. I said, I employ a bookkeeper and an accountant. I'd yeah. be a lot richer if I didn't have to over the past 23 years of paying their bills. Um, and you can probably do your own if you yeah. pay more attention to your maths. My maths is awful. I'm really good with money. I'm really bad at maths. It doesn't make any sense, but that's just it, you know. It's um, a different type of maths, isn't totally it? Totally different type, kind of maths. I mean. You know, whereas I've got friends who are really, really, really intelligent who work for the Welsh Assembly, for example. And they can't work out how to get a mortgage. And would sit with me and say, how do I get a mortgage? They're yeah, exactly. 50. And I'd be like, how have you got a mortgage and you're 50 years old? I don't know how to do it. Yeah. Don't understand how it works, but, you know, they and work I, for the Welsh Assembly. And that's in a, a really high-power position. And that's a big thing for us. It's like Huge. education. And that's what, like, this podcast about the YouTube channel and the stuff we're going to try and get. We're, we're kind of pushing out there for free. Um, because we want people to learn about that. Do you mm. I mean, and actually know how to do it properly. Yeah. I mean, because no one's really kind of doing like, and there's so much rubbish out there on the internet. You've got to be so careful. But yeah, no, I see. Like I say, it's, it's testament to you with what you kind of do with the kids. But you, you touched on COVID. Actually, I hate to use that c word, but um, I did think it was banned. Yeah, probably probably a banner will come up on YouTube because we even mentioned it now. Usually, what kind of happens? Um, but your industry, performing arts, I guess, yeah. Mm. Classes, yeah, uh, entertainment industry. Entertainment industry. Whole, yeah. um, had a heavy hit, didn't it? Huge. <laughs> it's crazy. I was like watching the, you know, the financial market crash in front of your eyes. Yeah. You know, when Mr. Boris Johnson uh, decided to say that the theatres can stay open, but nobody can go. Yeah. Otherwise you'll die, you know, that kind of thing. So obviously every single producer pulled their shows, gave up every actor, every single person who worked within the theatre and the television industry overnight their their red card almost to say, we're closed, here's two weeks' money and see ya, including the biggest that, producers. What was that evening like? Let's say when when that came out. Can you, you probably it's probably one of those um, PTSD things you don't want to bring to the forefront no, again, I, but can you remember... You know, were you sitting down in your in your I can kitchen remember and it, like did the phone start ringing and the amount of swear words that you started going and and, and what this wave of, of negativity because it's yeah. it's it's never happened before. You know, no, I was at home and I had all the kids there and trying to keep the kids all happy and up. You know, um, so playing games and I was cooking three meals a day for I had eight of them at home at the time. So my son back from London as he was in, a, in drama school back from London with his girlfriend um, and my other half's three kids. I was cooking for eight people every day, three like three meals a day. My other half's a nurse. So I was literally on the front line doing COVID. Um, and so I was dealing with closing two different offices, dealing with staff, dealing with clients. Uh, we had a new production company as well, all at the same time. So we were producing our first film, um, which we later went on to win a BAFTA for, which is incredible. Um, but you know, I remember standing in the sitting room and the, on the television and, and it was like everything went into slow motion, listening to him say, everything can stay open, but we say, don't go in so many words. Um, and literally all the kids laughing and joking and saying, oh, what's the problem kind of thing, not understanding it. Mm -hmm. And just going into like a shock, like slow motion, walk back into the kitchen and my phone just did not stop ringing. And the interesting thing is every single staff member said, what are you going to do about it? And I said, I have absolutely no idea, but I'm sure we'll work it out. And I didn't have a clue. Of course I didn't know. I've never dealt with it before. Nobody has. Um, and it was literally every minute of every day thinking, how are we going to sort this out? We did. And we did diversify, we did take on more influencers, yeah. we took on writers, people who could work during what, in my head, I thought was going to be at least a year of, you know, upheaval. To see the big boys like Cameron McIntosh firing people overnight, 
letting people go um, without redundancy packages either. You know, literally 10, 10 years in a show when you're out of work, got two weeks, been told two weeks. So all those people with mortgages and children, you know, they had no money. They're trying to get benefits, you know, when they've been earning whatever and they've spent their money. Uh, and then suddenly they've gone from earning, I don't know, 50, 60 grand a year, some of them 70 grand a year, 80 grand a year to nothing um, within two weeks. Are they all looking for you for yeah. the answer? Completely. So how do you how do you keep? Because you're gonna have inside. I imagine you're gonna feel shit. What the hell is going on? Yes. How we go? But externally, as well as in front of the family, and for all of these people that you look after, you're gonna have to be. We're coming up with a solution. We're, we're going to think of doing it this yes, way. That's what we do. While inside, it's going. Let's Absolutely. let's tell them something, and let's. How mm. do you keep motivated through that? How do you keep the because. Surely all the stuff that's in your head is going to be absolutely frying you day after day, potentially not sleeping, going, when is the end going to? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm, quite, um, I'm quite an optimistic person. I see things, if, when disasters and things go wrong, I, I generally always look for the silver lining. I'm one of those really irritating people. Like, people always say you always land on your feet. I don't always land on my feet. I just wobble quite a lot, like a weaver wobble or a well womble. <laughs> I get back up again. I go, right. I'm going to swear now, but I'm not, you know, yeah. you know, right, let's do this. Um, and I'm really, really blessed. I have incredibly supportive parents, have great kids. I've got a brilliant partner and my, uh, I've got staff that have worked for me. Well, one of them has been with Debbie's been with me 20 years. So yeah. um, I trust her. She trusts me. She trusts me that I'd get the, everybody out of the mess. Um, you know, and we, we, we worked hard as a team. My staff worked really, really hard. They watched other agents being got rid of overnight. Mm. Um, lots of my friends who were agents in London literally got rid of all their staff overnight. Um, was We didn't do that. We I handed the entire business for the Manchester office to the agent there and said, have everybody, have the business. Just gave her it to We closed the London office. Um, and took all the work from the London office down to Cardiff. And and it was the best thing for us that we could have ever done. And it made me realise, I said, the importance of your staff more than anything else and being loyal and trying to be as, as uh, creative as possible with their time. So so they weren't just sitting there going, oh, I got no work. You know, um, they were thinking outside the box. We could furlough a couple of people, which was great. Just let them have some time just to work out what they were, what they wanted and what they wanted to do. Part time furloughed some. But, you know, it was an ever changing thing. We just had to kind of work out. You know, different things would change. Sometimes a production would suddenly come out of nowhere. You know, and we'd have to take some of the, uh, the some of the uh, agents off furlough, uh, and then others we just had to kind of, you know, leave to it. It's it was it was stressful. It was really stressful. Yeah, yeah, and but well, I'm in a, in a weird weird way. I'm I'm not glad it happened because obviously nobody's glad it happened. But uh, it was a, a really good thing for me personally because it made me value much much more my family and the people I work with and I take work I look at work very differently to how I used to I don't look at it I don't get stressed about work like I used to anywhere near nowhere near because you know at the end of the day it's just work yeah. and even with the staff you know they've all gone through difficult times some have had you know mental health issues because of it and I've said look it's just work it's just a job and Ultimately, that's, you know, the way you've got to look at it. And your mental health is more important than the job, uh, same as mine is. So, you know, I do things like if you need a duvet day, just have, tell me you're going to have a duvet day and have a duvet day. It's if you want to work from home, work from home. If you want to come in the office, come in the office. You know, as long as they work and they value each other because if people stop performing in their jobs, other people have to pick up the pieces. Yeah. And they're all really supportive of each other. Hence why it works, and I'm supportive of my staff as best I can be. A reset of you and the business to understand what the priorities should be in life, where we were all on this roller coaster beforehand of of just cracking on with things and taking the 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 most important things in life for granted. Absolutely. Where before that time in March 2020. The, the the majority of us probably wouldn't have had a reset because we would have just mm. stayed in the hamster wheel. Definitely. Um, and you, I, I think you become 
more resilient to everything. And as you say, nothing seems impossible anymore because we all had to adapt like that overnight. And you can you can pivot and adapt to any any changing circumstance anymore. Where in the past, maybe we couldn't, or maybe we overanalyze things. And but mm. now you just go right. This happens. What what way? What route can we go down? How are we going to fix it? And how are we going to get out of it? Still maintaining my physical and mental health. Absolutely. And I and one of the things I I really did learn from it as well is taking the emotion out of it. It sounds like a silly thing to say, but. I think what happens to a lot of people is when things go wrong, they become so emotionally involved, uh, they don't actually see the wood from the trees. It's 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 interesting because I a friend of mine I met many years ago um, is a, a really was a very very big agent for the stars, and she comes from a, a very famous family, and I was with her one day, and she said about the twenty four hour rule. Uh, her husband's a, a a big lawyer, media lawyer, and uh, she had a client who she was earning. He was earning three, four million a year contract, and he left her. And she was so angry because he thought he wasn't going to pay a commission on this four million a year contract. Her husband said, "Do not do anything. It's a twenty-four hour rule. Before you pick up a phone." or put your fingers on any machine to text or email. And they put together an email to say, you know, you are within contract. These are the clauses. This is the solicitor. It's been really lovely to work for you. Um, I wish you all the best. If anything I can do, you know, to help you on your next journey, you know, blah, blah, blah. But this is how much you will owe, and this is what I expect to happen. And it was the best bit of his other advice, you know, was take the emotion out of it and a 24-hour rule. Before now, I'd have probably called him up and gone, she would certainly have, and she'd have been in business for 40 years. Called him up and said, what do you mean, mate? God's sake, I've just got you £4 million a year contract, you know? Um, but yeah, and as I said, COVID, that time during COVID was a bit like that. I think everybody was tested. Everybody tested. There was never going to be a time when you're going to be tested more than that. Oh, yeah. It's a bit 100%. like it was like being in a, f- a big American blockbuster movie, wasn't it? You know, that's why I liked it too. It literally was like some scene from a movie. Mm. I mean, when that announcement came in, yeah, it was kind of like, right, okay, take a breath. What are we going to do? Mm. At what stage are they going to make a movie about it? To another two or three years, yeah, when the emotions are kind of a bit who's going to make uh, it? <laughs> I think they've started already looking at movies, yeah, yeah, they will yeah, have, yeah, definitely. There'll, there'll, be, there'll be people outlining there, won't they? And, Things take time to get off the ground, but you know, it's it's yeah, who will be the first? Yeah, that'll be it. Um let's go to so how many how much talent are you looking after at the moment? Do you know, I, I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. It's probably around about two hundred. Yeah, nice. I've got six six agents. Wow. Um which is not bad. Most agents in London look after about eighty um eighty clients each, yeah, maybe. Yeah. Um, and so we, we try to keep it as low as possible only because so it's manageable it's manageable and it's 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 more of a personal management rather yeah. than as a a big you know machine, uh, machine. Type of, a lot yeah. of the big agents have thousands of clients they actually don't actually know who they have a lot of the time yeah you know no it's interesting so then we talk uh kind of a lot about in kind of podcasts and things like that. It's, it's sudden wealth syndrome and and it's, I guess it's kind of generally categorized that when someone comes into a lot of money quite suddenly mm. and they struggle to cope with it, mm. which can be lottery winners, people who sell their business, but also can be people who've suddenly broken into, you know, kind of media and TV and suddenly they're getting these big contracts and a lot of money and actually yeah. don't know how to deal with it. Do you come across that? Yeah. Yeah, we have done quite a lot over the years. Um, I, you know, I'm not a financial advisor and I'm not somebody who says I know anything about money. I just all I've ever advised any of our performers to do is to seek advice um, and to invest well, i.e., you may, I always say every dog has his day. That's the first thing. You're only young for two minutes. That's my other line. And it's true because you may be pretty and young at 21 and everybody mm-hmm. wants you on a billboard, but as soon as you get to 40 and you're fat, it's harder to sell you. Um, and I think that it, you don't see that when you're 21. You you know, we, we no. think we're going to be 21 forever. Um and all that I know is that advice that I'd been given at 21 about buying properties and putting money that I was earning when I was earning a really good wage as a performer was the best advice I could have ever been given. And putting money into bricks and mortar, 
is really a safe bet. No matter how high the mortgage rates go, no matter how much properties cost, they may fall, but they'll rise again. They fall, yeah. they rise again. And over a lifetime, things equal out. You'll always have something to sell then if you fall on the bones of your bottom. You know, as a performer, if you're not working, you can remortgage, you know, or to take some equity out, things like that. You know, it's it's giving you the flexibility, especially if you've done it well. We've got one client, she was in a TV show for years, and she's bought, I think she's got 20 houses. Really? And she's now really well known as a singer, as well as an actress, but oh. it's got 20 houses all rented out. She doesn't yeah, ever see. have to work again. Yeah. And that's being savvy. And you, and you see that yeah. with some of the footballers, don't you? You know, like there was always that, uh, was the song from the terraces for uh, Robbie Fowler, one in Liverpool, we all live in a Robbie Fowler house, wasn't it? But Because mm. he, he was quite, a lot of footballers are not very savvy with him, and he, but he was, wasn't he? There's, Buying there, up streets of them in Liverpool, wasn't he? There's a, there's a difference, I think, for footballers and and reality, because over, over the weekend there was two two things, and one, I was reading the papers on, on my phone, there was a footballer that played for Liverpool, Stoke, and that Jermaine Pennant, and... He's had um, mental health issues, but he had, I think he earned 10 million quid over the course of his lifetime, and he's now bankrupt. His yeah. house went uh, was, was burnt, um, but when he moved to Spain, he left his Porsche in the car park in, Sp- in uh, the UK and forgot he had it. So you kind of think, <laughs> guys, and he said, I bought properties. I didn't even know I had a mortgage on, one in Cheshire that was 2 million or something. But then you have um, yesterday in the, uh, the Sunday Times, they always interview somebody, um, and yesterday was Louis Spence. And he said, I went from is it Pineapple Studios, yeah, pineapple. 35 grand a week, a year yeah. to um, the show. And he said, I was earning over a million pounds a year like that. And he said, there was a 10, a 20, a 40, a 60 grand check coming through the post every single day. And he said, it was unbelievable. I was just getting paid shed loads of money. He said, me and my partner were given, I told Gareth this morning, 60 grand to go away to Grand Canaria to film um, three minutes each day so they could put something together. He said, they paid for us. They gave us mm-hmm. 60 grand. He said, it was unbelievable. But in fairness to him, he, he acts a bit of a fool. He said, financially, I'm stable. I don't need to work. I've got two properties, one here, one in Spain. He, I think he's he's done well for himself. Yeah, He's had a good lifestyle. He knew, he said, it was never going to last and he's not as busy now. But financially, he can pick and choose what he wants. He said, yeah. it has dried up. But many don't do that, do they? But he's okay. Yeah, and he does dance uh, academies and things like that as well. So he's got a whole other business that he'd have an income off that he's not always at. You know, he he's... also said he'd come out to your to your party yeah. for ten grand. Yeah, <laughs> it's crazy, isn't it? But it's you know that's that's clever. That's yeah. that's the right thing to do. And I I think ultimately, unless you've got a good manager behind a lot of performers, yeah. they do fall by the wayside. Um, and and also explain it's really difficult because you don't want to say to somebody look you're doing really well now but it might all dry up because some people just continuously work and always do well for 20 30 years you know who's anybody to tell anybody that it might dry yeah, up exactly. or they might get as i said fat and fat and old you know it's, yeah. it's, can, can it's ask, you know do you ha- do you have to be the the type of person if you have a good relationship with somebody that you're looking after that I understand they're in potentially the public eye. So they have to potentially always look good, always wear good clothes, always be seen potentially at an event, um, drive a good car. Do you have to sometimes tell people to rein it in and and understand that, you know, incomes versus outgoings may need to, to be um, balanced out because this might not all... You, that you have... You, is a responsibility, what I'm saying, is for you to protect the future of them rather than them just living a lifestyle that might be a bit fake at the moment because there's far too much money coming in now that there might be in the future. It's not really your job as a okay. as a manager, really. Um, you know, you can give hints and, and advise as much as you like, but yeah. I think what you find with a lot of performers, and especially influencers, that... You know, they get a lot of people giving them advice. They get a lot of them giving advice that benefits them. Mm. Yeah. And for you to then say, well, actually, mate, look, you're not you're, you're not that talented anyway. You're only making loads of money because you've just struck gold being on a program. Everybody thinks you're cute at the moment. You're going to be fat within the next couple of years. Uh, you're talentless and people will be on to the next Love Islander after that. I can see why you wouldn't put it that way to them yeah, sat, and sat on the sofa next you to you. Can't. <laughs> exactly that. And, th- and, and, and it is that, you know, we, we get constantly asked for 
to represent people who've been on these shows all of the time. Yeah. And Geraint and I have to sit down and go, right, okay, are they going to work? Um, same as MPs, you know, so we look after people like Carmen Jones, the ex-first yeah. minister we look after. Um, you know, and, you know, he does lots of after dinner speaking. Yes. He does his, he's got his book. He's he's on programs, the Welsh language programs primarily. You know, I've known him 20 years because our sons are good friends. But I knew him and I knew he was, there was more to him than just that, that job description. He was also a lawyer before that, a barrister before that. So I knew that, knew that you know, Karen was going to be somebody that we could work with and we'd enjoy working yeah. with. A lot of people that come to us who've come off some of the reality programs, you know, have all they want to do is be famous. And that is a complete difference to what I started out the industry in. It wasn't like that. You know, you didn't have to be, you know, uh, you, you had to be talented. You had to have trained. You had to have done your dues. You know, be you passionate about it as well. Passionate. You know, start off as an ASM or go to drama school for three years, you know. Put the graft in. Graft. Real graft. And I think, unfortunately, we're living in a world where we see talentless people becoming famous and earning lots of money overnight by, you know, doing very little. Um, and and that also influences the, our kids that are watching TikTok yeah. videos oh, of people 100%. who are earning millions and millions of pounds. So, you know, giving them a reality check is difficult. And also, going back to what you're saying, that money isn't always going to come in. Yeah. It isn't. And when you're living off, we all do it, if you think about it. We're all living on a salary that we have. And some months we overspend more than we should. Or, you know, we we, we get a car, a car that we probably can't afford. Um, and then the money stops. COVID taught that middle kind of band of people earning, you know, that 40 plus hit them hardest. Because they were the ones with the mortgages and the cars. Uh, keeping up with the Joneses and suddenly went, Jesus, I can't afford this Porsche or I can't afford this. And all my friends with Porsches suddenly got rid of them. You know, I thought, oh, okay, that's interesting. Um, and I think it was time. I went, thank God I'm still driving around my old Discovery. You know, thank, you know, I haven't got, I don't know anything on it. Yeah. It's, it's, and I thank God I got rid of that massive stupid house I had for 10 years. Do you know, it was thing, it is things like that. That, um, you know, we can't explain it to a 20-year-old, really. It's really tough to explain it to them. We start, as you said, as we were talking about earlier on, start talking to them about mortgages and understanding what that means and the reason for that and how difficult it is to actually get a mortgage in the first place. If you can get a mortgage and you're in a position to do it, sometimes you may, as a performer, never be in a position to have a full-time contract. So you're self-employed and being self-employed, getting a mortgage is practically impossible unless back in the day you could have a guarantor, you know, you can't even do that now. So I can't even guarantee, you know, be a guarantor to any of my kids, you know, to get a mortgage um, other than help them get a mortgage by teaching them the way to, you know, have the bank statements in order, as you yeah. say, and all of those things. Yeah, that's a big thing that we teach them because we, we do... We got a lot of clients in the kind of media industry, which we've helped with mortgages, even ones during COVID when things were mm. hard. But we were able, because we got a choice of like ninety odd lenders, we yeah. can find a lender who was actually quite sympathetic to the industry, yeah. and we'll kind of do it. But it is hard, do you know what I mean? Especially from the self-employed point mm. of view. But it is getting things in order, mm. and that's a big thing we try and teach people. Because we get people coming to us and go, and you get a mortgage, and you're looking right. Your account has been really savvy with your tax. Yes. But he's not helping you wanting to get a mortgage. No, it's you know true. I mean? it's true. And it's, um, and it's a little bit of having that kind of conversation then. Mm. When, when we talk a lot about financial freedom and it's the ability to, to live your best life now while at the same time remove any fear in the future of running out of money, I said that, that's that's an ideal situation. But for the 21-year-old who was maybe stacking shelves in Asda eight weeks ago, and earning eight pounds an hour, and now is getting twenty twenty grand a night. Mm. They probably see that this this is the new life for me. This is never going mm. to run out. Mm. That's I suppose I, I get your point now. That's hard to instill into them. Come on, it's never going to be like this all the time. You you were able to live on eight pounds an hour. Um, yeah. Now you're on twenty grand a week. Do you know what? Even if you live on mm. five, squirrel away the the fifteen. Yeah. But 
they don't because they're 20 year olds and well, they're not educated I, yeah, properly. And, and I don't even think it's just 20 year olds. I mean, lots of people who are in their 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s still still live like that. They, you know, some in the one extremes to the other. You know, I've got an, a, an old person in, in my life who's 94 and has just gone into a home and has something like 250,000 in her bank account sitting there, but catches the drips of the water from the tap in the sink to flush the toilet. Wow. So, you know, there's extremes. There is. Off. Yeah. yeah. And to me, I'd rather flush my toilet and, do you know what I mean? You just kind of have, and not have 250,000 bank account. Absolutely. That nobody can enjoy, because yeah. I, I, it's certainly not her, because she's sitting in a home now. It's balance, isn't it? And Completely that's what balance, we try yeah. to instill in people is that, yeah. You know, live for today, but keep one eye on the future. Yeah, plan for tomorrow. Because you yeah. don't watch around the corner. Like we yeah. always kind of say to people, life's not a rehearsal. Yeah, you, you never really? know what you never know what's coming next. Yep. So you've got to have that one eye on the future, but also you've got to live for today. You can't be that person who, you know, worries about. I'm not going to go out for that meal with friends on a Friday because I might not have any money in twenty years' time to retire. Okay. Go out for that meal, but don't have a start, don't have a dessert if you're going to do it, but still going to have fun. Do you know yeah, what I, mean? I agree with you. It, it's, it's being that, it's change, mm. shifting that mindset. But I think a lot of people have gone the opposite way because of social media and like, yeah, sod anything to do with the future, sod tomorrow, I'm just going to spend for the day. Yeah, and I, I get a bit of that. I understand that as well. I do. Uh, you know, at the end of the day, who do we actually owe money to? Do you know what I mean? Look at the government. It's not really li- giving a very good example to youngsters anyway, is it? Nobody gets on. Everybody's on strike. You know, n- no, you know, the government can't, you know, stick to any one thing. If our political leaders change as quickly as they do, you know, how can a 20-year-old, go back to 20-year-old, how can a 20-year-old look at that and look that's what's running us and have any faith in anything at all. Um, you know, if they want to have that car, they want to have that car. If they want to mm. have those shoes, they want to get those shoes. And as you say, they, they want to have to think about the future. And and that that's the big issue that I see, that everyone from, from a 17-year-old to a, a 60-year-old is looking at a government who really don't give a damn about anything. They, they decide... We need more money. We'll borrow more money. Nobody mm. knows where they're getting it from. Nope. They're spending it like it's gone out of fashion. And you know the thing of years ago when when one uh, party came in and they they look at their little red box and they open it up and go, "There's nothing n- nothing left in the kitty." <laughs> if if an organisation, i.e., government, that are running a country are doing that, that then paints a picture to Joe Public, be the seventeen year old, the sixty year old, that do you know what? Just keep borrowing. Just keep borrowing. Have a good life because. We'll worry about paying things back in the future. And who knows, we could be locked down again. So it's a, mal- a, a combination of those two, you know, what the future might be bad again and other people. Mm. Let's do do as they do, not Absolutely. as they say. And it's not going to get any better. No. And also, I think the problem we have is when you look at um, a lot of businesses that have gone bankrupt. So and business entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs who've gone bankrupt three or four times. Yeah. What example do they give? You know, the fact that, you know, people are investing their hard-earned cash into some businesses, knowing full well, uh, you know, this one person I know did it recently in Cardiff. And uh, my argument when everybody said to me, oh, I'm thinking about doing this, putting 80 grand into this put this hotel, I said, you, you, you'll lose it. Well, why will I lose it? Because he's been bankrupt twice before. Ah, how do you know that? Uh, just do a bit of research. Due diligence, have you given 80 grand away? It's 80 grand. Um, and I think that's, you know, it's it goes back to being dazzled by the lights of fame and fortune. Nothing worth having, you know, it's nothing's for back, free. It? It's nothing quick. is for free. Hard graft is the only way you're going to make serious money that's worth keeping and having. It's not dirty money, firstly, because, you know, they say there's always an old saying of no business is ever a clean business to make a lot of money. You know, probably a lot of big businesses you know, there's at what some point you have to sell some anybody I know who've made a lot of money have sold somebody out along the line. Um, you know, and a lot of people can't live with themselves to do that. So there's always those moral grounds on things like that yeah. as well. You know, or you know, they've decided to keep small because they don't want the pressures of that. You know, we certainly got to a point in business that it was become to become a much bigger entity, merged with two other companies. And I sat down and I thought <sighs> What am I doing? Why am why why do I want to do this? And I made the decision not to do it because I didn't want 
to have people, other people having control over my life, um, having a say in what I could and couldn't do. I want to be able to go on holiday with the kids anytime I want. I want to be able to take a day off if I fancy it. I want to be able to do the school run. Sounds ridiculous. I love taking my kids to school in the morning and I love picking them up. And if they're ill, I can go and get them. And if I've got a meeting, I have to do my meetings. I reschedule them if there's some, the kids take priority. Yeah. Because, you know, it is that old saying about the gravestone. There's nobody put so they were a really good businessman or a really good businesswoman ever. You never see it. Oh, they got me so many jobs. I did all these jobs because of her or because of him. They don't. They don't. People don't thank you. They forget all of that. Yeah. And even if they do thank you, you know, it doesn't matter. It's just work. But you do go, I miss my mum, you know, I loved my mum. My mum was a good mum or my dad was a good dad. Um, and those things we all learned during COVID, you know, to people who had shopping taken to them and the people who didn't, you know, and people who were ill on their own and the people who died on yeah. their own and all of those things. Um, and how lucky we are to have, you know, to have, to have learnt those, that more than ever before during COVID. Yeah, I think it taught us a lot of lessons. Yeah, it? it did. Do you got a talent agency, production company, Casablanca, your properties, your family? Yeah. What's next? Just What's the future in, hold? Well, to be honest, just to enjoy them all, really. Um, now more than ever, to keep the businesses going, um, keep them ticking over. I think, I think there's always a. Um, this is something I've learned. It's that we we're always. I've always, as a person, always tried to push, push for more, push for better, push to do better. And I think I've got to a stage in life where I go to maintain what we have, to where we're at, would be wonderful. Um, because. I'm comfortable. The agents who work for me are comfortable. We love what we do. We all have a happy, we all get on, we all laugh. To go into work and laugh every day and to go home and laugh every night and to have happy kids, healthy, happy kids um, and family to me is what it's all about. It's not about anything else. What else is there to have? I haven't got a yacht. I don't particularly like the ocean. I like, you know, don't, don't get me on a Poseidon adventure, put it like that. No. You know, I'd like a few more holidays a year because I haven't been on holiday for four years, but that's because of, you know, the C word again. And because I wanted to build business and get to a point that, as I say, I could be mum. So we're just doing what we're doing, keeping Casablanca ticking over. So it's becomes, you know, a, a, a place that people want to come to on a regular basis make it a second home for people nice. um, and keep all the actors happy and influencers happy and the uh, singers and dancers happy, radio presenters, telly presenters. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, it Reality is just, keep, yeah, it's just keeping everybody yeah. happy. And well, still content. enjoying your own life. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so. And that's it. And as I say, I'm really blessed to have the people I've got in my life to support me. That's superb. Thank you. Thank you for your time. All the best in the future and thank you very, very much. Thank you too. Thank you both.